Uh, welcome everybody to part two of the airplane scratch building series. Uh, today I'm going to be turning this pile of wood here into the airplane fuselage, hopefully. Or it might be turning it into a pile of garbage, I don't know. Hey, let's go find out, huh? The first thing that I do is trace the shape of the parts that I need from the plans to a second sheet of paper. Now you don't have to do it this way. You could just cut up the plans. That's not really a problem. I don't really like cutting them up. Uh, plus, I'm making a number of small changes to the parts, so this is just the easier way to go for me. One way of transferring the shape of the parts from the plans to the wood is something I call the tattoo method. Basically, you lay the plans over the wood, and then you take a pin and you poke around the edges, uh, making a, a series of dots in the wood, and then you can just use a ruler and a pencil to connect the dots. Simple as that. The advantage here is that you don't have to cut up the plans. The disadvantage is that it can be difficult to lay out parts close to each other on the wood. For simple shapes such as squares and rectangles, you can just measure them off the plans and draw them straight on the wood as you see me doing here. My preferred way of transferring the shapes is what I call the cut and paste method. Simply cut the shapes out of the plans, uh, lay them on the wood and arrange them to your heart's content, then go raid your kids' school supplies for a glue stick and glue the paper down. Now be sure you don't go too crazy with the glue because you want the paper to be able to peel off of the wood easily when you're done cutting. Once you get all the parts cut out and the paper peeled off, don't forget to mark them so that you can keep track of what part is what. When I cut lightning holes, I like to use a drill press to make sure I get a nice smooth radius corner. Also, don't forget to uh, use a sacrificial piece of wood behind your part so that you get a nice clean cut. Once I have the corners drilled, I use my Rockwell Blade Runner saw to cut out the rest of the lightning hole. One of the things I like about this saw is the fact that you don't have to disconnect the blade to get into the holes. I'll provide a link in the description where you can find this saw. I also take this opportunity to center drill the motor mount holes. With all our parts cut out, now we can actually start assembling the airplane. Uh, don't forget to put down some wax paper or uh, saran wrap first, though, just you know, so you don't glue the airplane to the plans. I've covered my work table with a repurposed cardboard box from a refrigerator. This way I can hold the parts in place by sticking T-pins through them into the cardboard. Alright, so now we unpin it. And... Hopefully it's not too terribly stuck to the plans. And there we go, the first side is done. Let's move on to the next one. A few things to keep in mind when you're building the second side. One, actually build the other side. Nothing much more embarrassing than removing the wing of your Gwillows B-17 from the plans only to realize that you've built two right wings. Ask me how I know. <laughs> two, it's more important that the second side match up to the first than to the plans. This will help keep your fuselage free of any unwanted twists or warps. Now keep in mind, there may be differences between the left and right side. The nose portion of the frame may be longer or shorter on one side to move the angle of the firewall to give you an offset thrust. You may have hatches, openings, ports, and that sort of thing on one side that aren't on the other. But in this case, the two sides really are mirror imaged of each other. All right, so there we go. I'd say I got the two sides pretty much identical. Well, maybe I should say mirror image to each other. Uh, that's probably the better way to word it. Next thing to do now is to join them together. I'll start with the landing gear box in the front. This is the part I've really been looking forward to because I designed that whole gear box section myself. So super excited for it. Let's get going. I start joining the sides by first marking out the location of each of the formers. I then promptly realized that I didn't install the diagonal braces when I was building the sides, so I kind of go back and do that step. Once I'm done with that, I start test fitting the landing gear box pieces in place. They have to fit perfect against each other, there can't be any gaps, or, or otherwise there'll be structural issues down the road. Once I'm satisfied with the fit of the parts, I just tack glue them in place with some thin CA glue. From there, I start working my way forward, then aft, attaching the formers to the sides of the airplane. All right, so I've run into my first little hiccup here. When I lengthened the nose of the airplane, I had to add a whole other former in here, and I decided to call the former F4M, and were modified because I modified the height. However, as you can see, I forgot to modify the width of the former, so neither of these work, and I'm going to have to make new ones. All right, so uh, snafu number two here. When I redesigned the midsection, uh, that involved changes to former number four, so I decided to call it 4.5 because it's only about half the height. 
and the height is right, but again, the width is wrong, as you can see, by about a half an inch. So there's two of them, and I dropped them. I meant to do that. Gravity's working. So here's the solution I've come up with. I took the two pieces, cut them kind of in half, uh, I guess you could say two thirds or whatever on each side. Now I just put them in place and can open it up until I get just the right fit. Then mark where the ends should be. This is how I was gonna join the two halves anyway with a medium CA. You just put plenty of it in here. When we put it together in the mark at the marks and then clamp it good and tight there we go and then i'm going to let it sit for a few minutes just like this so that glue sets up completely take the clamps off and we should be good to go just like that two halves are laminated together the whole thing's tacked in place and now we're ready to move on to something a lot more important it's very important that the tail section of the fuselage be perfectly straight to check you make a mark in the exact center of each former and then sight along it kind of like a gun sight just like so and if every dot lines up then you know you're right on and as near as I can tell everything is perfectly centered if it's off it's not off by enough to cause any problems to check the bottom we already have these notches cut in the center of each former for the keel so you can just sight down those the same way you did with, with the dots and you can tell if they're lined up now notice that number former number nine here is a little bit off so how do we fix this well there's a couple different ways uh, the bottom of the fuselage is going to be sheeted uh, so you could just hold it in the right position as you put the sheeting on but I've noticed that as I twist it to the right position, I feel a little bit of balsa sliding on balsa. And what it is, it's right down here, it's these tips. So it looks like if I hold those in just the right position, it lines everything up straight. By the way, it does not take long <laughs> before your uh, bottle of CA glue uses a T-pin for a cap. So, yep, just pushing it to the right position there, sighting down that to make sure it's lined up perfectly, and then I come along and tack it in place. Give it a few seconds to set up, and now I can let go, and they're staying perfectly lined up. Now, I know some of you are like, hey, what about the differences here? It's not that big a deal. I can shave some of the material off this side, even add a little to this side, or do both. Now that I've done that on the bottom, I'm going to want to check the alignment here as well and it looks like it is still right on so we're good another way you can straighten it out too instead of sheeting it if you're doing diagonal braces like this maybe like it's a cub or something you're building uh, you can just hold it in the right position and then put your diagonal braces in on the top uh, it would be good to have a helper for that uh, to hold it in the right position as you're going but that's another possibility if you're not sheeting things Next, I add some quarter by quarter inch balsa sticks at the formers to reinforce the fuselage sides. The plans actually call for eighth inch by half inch balsa sheet strips, but I've got these available, so that's what I'm using. After that, I sheet the bottom of the tail section with 332 inch balsa. A, a single six inch by 48 inch piece will actually take care of the entire tail. Moving around to the top, I install some eighth inch by half inch spruce spar scraps to act as the wing saddles. I'll cover more about where and how I got those in a future video. Before I can sheet the bottom of the nose section here, I have to finally glue the inside of the landing gear box. I'm going to do that using strips of some fiberglass left over from a canoe I built a couple years ago and some 30 minute epoxy. The epoxy I'm using, by the way, is the Bob Smith Industries brand which I've been using for a long time. It's a great company, great product. They're not paying me to say this. I'm just saying it because they're an awesome company. But if they want to pay me to say it, uh, you know, I won't say no to them. <laughs> uh, I really like the fact they're made in the U.S. And I just realized, looking at the package uh, after buying this one, proud sponsors of the Wounded Warrior Project. So, hey, awesome on you guys, Bob Smith Industries. I find it handy to keep a piece of old cereal box cardboard around, too. It's great to have as a, a, like a mobile cutting board kind of thing. You can also use it for mixing your epoxies and uh, other stuff on. So, 
Not really sure how much I'm going to need, but one way to find out. <laughs> An acid brush is a real easy way of getting the epoxy into these uh, joints here too. Now that the epoxy in the landing gear box is set up, I can start with the sheeting on the bottom. Now I'm just going to put it in place and I'm going to mark the back side with a pencil. Then I'm going to cut it a little oversized. Then I line it up on the back flush with the edge of the step but only uh, halfway up onto the keel because the other side needs the other half. And then I'm going to use some medium CA, again Bob Smith Industries. Good stuff. Just a little dot in each corner. And there we go. Move on to the next piece. The one part I'm not tacking together and actually final gluing right now is the joints between the pieces. Doing that with thin CA. And gluing my fingers to the piece at the same time. Uh, well, part of building an airplane. A little twist and there we go. Now that I got both skins cut out, I've taped them together. I turned them over. This is the inside or the top, if you want to call it that. And I'm going to apply a layer of fiberglass to that before I install it on the frame. I've already cut out the glass and I'm going to carefully set it over here. The epoxy that I'm using right now is left over from an RC sailboat I built last winter, but West Systems or Fiberlay epoxies will work just fine. This epoxy is mixed at a 5 to 1 ratio. I know I just put 30 grams of resin in there, so it should be about 6 grams of hardener. And maybe a little extra just in case I suck at math. Oh wait, I do suck at math. There we go, all the glass is wet, laying down flat against the wood. Now we can go ahead and actually start to install it on the airplane. Big question is, how do I turn it over without dropping it? And now we let it set up uh, overnight. Now I can hear several of you asking me, Dennis, why are you putting a layer of fiberglass on the inside of the hull? Shouldn't it only be on the outside? Actually, no. Putting a layer on either side is a stronger way. Let me demonstrate. Let's pretend that this is the balsa wood core and that uh, these two pieces of uh, cardboard here are the fiberglass. By themselves, none of these materials are very resistant to flex. Put them together like this with just the uh, fiberglass on one side, same thing, still flexes. In fact, even with two layers of fiberglass on one side, it still flexes easily. But when I put a layer of fiberglass on either side, the story changes. Now it's a lot more resistant to flexing. Why is that? Well, if I'm bending it like this, what's happening on the top is it's getting loaded in tension now. The bottom uh, is being loaded in compression and the core here is more in a shear slash compression kind of load. Basically, by putting these materials together like this, you're now applying the loads to each individual material in the way that it's best able to resist it. 
Now that the epoxy on the inside has had all night to set up and I've sanded the edges down nice and flush with the sides, I can start putting the fiberglass on the bottom. To answer the questions why I've been handling cloth with kid gloves all this time, it's because I've biased the weave at 45 degrees to the aircraft center line, which is kind of like so. A 45 degree bias will form around compound curves without creating any wrinkles. And there's kind of sort of a compound curve up in the front here where it, it forms in, into the bow. The downside of the 45 degree bias is that if I were to stretch it too much lengthwise or widthwise, I wouldn't be able to get the piece of fiberglass back to the right shape and be able to use it, and I don't have enough cloth over there to make another one. So there we go, fuselage all framed up, ready to go. Now I'm going to wait till closer to the end before I sheep the top of the nose here. I still have to figure out exactly where the battery needs to go to get the balance point just right, and I won't be able to do that until I have the tail, wings, and all the mechanical bits installed. Uh, speaking of mechanical bits, next up, building the retractable landing gear, which is something I'm super excited for. I've always wanted to build one for myself. I've built them for other people, just never for me. But that's gonna have to wait for the next video because this one's getting kind of long. In the meantime, check the description for links to some of the products that you've seen. If you liked it, hit that thumbs up button. If you didn't like it, well, you, you're boring, go away. If you wanna see more like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you wanna know when the next video is ready to go, that's what the bell icon's for. Until next time, remember, it's not really worth flying if you didn't build it yourself.